webinar is now streaming. I see a message on my screen. Okay. <clears throat> Very good. Perfect. Yeah, it went straight there. I don't know what happened last time. So that's all worked out. Um, and then what we can do after the fact is I can go in and just edit off the, the part that chunk in the beginning. Cool. So that when people watch a replay, it's just the, the program. All right. I just got a text message that the manuscript for my novel has just been accepted for review by a um, Hollywood screenwriter. Wow. Now, how many hundreds write <laughs> of script ideas do they get? But, you know, it's like the hurdle thing, right? Yeah. So it's yeah. another hurdle. Wow. There you go. Wow. Congratulations. That's incredible. Well, well. Well, keep working at it, man. <laughs> when you believe in a story and you've lived with it as long as I have, I mean, I'm sure that all writers think their stuff is good, but, um, you know, I just want to put it in a lot of hands and then people will eventually, the, the combined feedback will tell me if I was right or not. We'll see. There you go. There you go. I'm pleased by the number of people who want autographed copies. Some people have sent me their book, asked me to sign it and send it back because they want to be sure to have a signed copy just in case. Mm -hmm. Who knew? I mean, I gave my wife a signed copy, but she's my wife. Come on, you know. But <laughs> there was additional demand for that. Sure. <laughs> yeah, it'd be uh, kind of strange if she didn't want it. If she just, <laughs> no thanks. And we do have, uh, I have a bookcase in the living room and it has, you know, those small little rectangular cubes. So we cleared out one cube and we put a copy of the novel there on its own easel. So it just stands there by itself in the middle of the bookcase. Anybody who comes in will have to see it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe put some streamers by it or like a frame of some kind. So well, really there's, there's no sense in going over the top, Matt. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. My personality is extroverted enough as it is. I need to put streamers in my library. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. All right. Five minutes till we start. And what is this? So you haven't let anybody in yet. Doesn't look like. It only shows three participants. Yeah, it does. I just got an email from uh, Kathy Burt saying, yeah. yeah. I will fix that really quickly. I don't know why their link's not working. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, go ahead and let her know that I'm, I'm going to resend it in a, just a second. That was interesting, Matt, when you turn to the left to work on your computer, as you lean forward, 
your nose was eliminated. It disappeared into the background. So suddenly your face didn't have any curves. Oh, yeah, is that is that freaky? It's yeah. Right. I mean, you lean forward, it disappeared. You lean back, it came back. It was like your nose was growing as you were backing up. Yeah, right there it is. Yeah. Oof, or there magic. it was. Digital yeah. magic. That's what we're doing. <laughs> ah. Matt, I just sent you the link because you sent the email to the patrons earlier. Can you send that? Otherwise, I have to download the list. Oh no, that is perfectly fine. Cool. Thank you. This is a new one. I haven't had it happen where their link didn't work. Just sent it out and then I have to send another one. Yeah, I'm getting <laughs> a ton of emails. Of course, this happens on the first time I'm supposed to. Good thing I should. I also probably messed it up. <laughs> Here we go. Hi, everybody. Thanks for going through the technical difficulties with us. We're going to get started in a couple of minutes. We're going to maybe wait a couple of minutes so people can uh, come in. We have a few watching on YouTube that may not have been able to get in initially. So just right. so you have that info. Annie, I'm getting text messages from patrons also telling me what they're telling you in email. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we might, if it's okay with you, we'll wait a few minutes. So of we course, can of course. I can always speak faster. It's not a problem. <laughs> All right, Jerry, thank you for your email. Same with Kathy and Peter. Thank you so much for letting us know. It's always good that you tell us that we're having problems then. It's never figuring out what's going on and then no one sees it. Um, as always, when we have these kind of programs, we'll have a Zoom live, but we'll also have it live on YouTube. So if you do ever experience uh, technical problems with Zoom, check it on YouTube um, so we can all, also see it there. But yeah, we're just going to wait maybe two more minutes for people to get the new link and get logged in. And then uh, we'll let Gary do his thing. And then, uh, well, I'll wait for my introduction. There. 
Is this where we entertain the patron entertain the patrons with our barbershop duet that we haven't practiced? <laughs> uh, it, it's uh, cute that you think I know any barbershop quartet songs. That would be <laughs> if I was a. Uh, well, I, I was thinking more actual on the lines of Abbott and Costello and who's on first. That usually generates laughs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you were talking about shadow puppets earlier. This is the time. This is the time. Now we're getting messages from the patrons who are listening into us. <laughs> <laughs> we just we just hate dead airspace, that's all. <laughs> yes. Dead air is a killer. Uh, I hated you too. <laughs> 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 we do have a request to do the routine. Sorry, <laughs> uh, we just don't have enough time. And I don't want to outshine Gary. That's really where it comes from. I don't want to outshine him. You came for him, not for my incredible. <laughs> uh, we do have a question. If the I don't know, know if it's still on YouTube. Matt, do you save it? That was from two months ago. Do you still have it up? The last one? Yeah, episode three. Yes. Okay, because someone just asked about that uh, in, I don't know, it's a chat or something or other, uh, asked if it was available, and I, I truly don't know. It is. Okay. It is. Okay. <laughs> you know, why don't we, why don't we get started? And because um, I think everyone... People who join in later, they get here a little bit later. Let's get this started. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to our program here digitally on the Schomburg Township District Library internet. Uh, you already know Gary, because this is part four of a six part series. Uh, Gary is a usual, regular, and loved presenter here at the library. Uh, please, if you can, try and keep your questions to the end. There, you know, notice there's a Q&A and a chat function. If you could please use the Q&A function at the end, that way Gary doesn't get bombarded with messages while he's presenting. Um, as always, these are recorded live onto YouTube, and if you want to access them later or previous versions of this, previous episodes, if you will. They're also on our YouTube page to watch at your leisure. So I think that is enough for me. I'm gonna hand it over to Gary, thanks so much. Okay, welcome everyone to part four of the series about the evolution of the presidency. We are going to begin with um, a technical announcement. Oh, I have to end the, sorry, I gotta close the poll out, there we go. We're gonna start with a technical announcement and then I'm going to talk about three books and then we will go into the presentation. The list of the presidents we're going to talk about today was included uh, in a link for you. So you can grab that as the very first chat, by the way. Here is the technical announcement. As you may or may not be aware, uh, Zoom has been experiencing some difficulties. YouTube has been rel relatively harsh uh, with the inclusion of some content that it says was not properly registered. So Annie Tillman and I in discussion agreed that certainly for this program and probably for the next two, there will be no video content at all, which means yes, I'm gonna be speaking the entire time, which I'm quite capable of, but I normally like to include videos, but they're simply aren't going to be because the technical difficulties or the pushback from YouTube just isn't worth it. Now, way back at the beginning of this, when we were actually face-to-face, -face, way back at the beginning of the year, I mentioned two books, and I'm going to mention them again. I'll hold up copies for you. And I'm going to mention them again today because if the subject of all of our presidents or the presidency is of interest to you, then these are two books that you should look at. The first is called To the Best of My Ability. The editor is James McPherson, To the Best of My Ability. And this is updated every time we get a new president. And I'm sure that you can access that. I'm, I'm not 100% certain, but it's quite likely 
that that's available at the library. You can certainly get it. And different historians write about uh, different presidents that they have information about. I also like this because it has a short version of every presidential election, and it includes every presidential inaugural speech, which for me, I find very interesting as I do research. The second book, which I'm going to read from today, is called American Heritage, The Presidents. And this is edited by Michael Beschloss, who is regarded as, in all likelihood, the number one living presidential historian. His knowledge is encyclopedic, and he wrote all of the chapters about all of the presidents who are in this book. And I'll be reading from this book in just a minute. The third book that I'm going to mention is a bit more personal. It's called Bustville, and it's my novel. Uh, eight days after our last meeting, which was two months ago, on July 21st, this was published on Amazon. It's my first novel. Uh, sales are doing well. Uh, it has a number of five-star reviews. We're advertising it, et cetera. And if uh, the subject of school bus drivers, which is what this is about, hence the yellow buses, if that topic interests you, then go to Amazon, look at the plot summary, and see if you might want to buy a copy of it. It's called Busville. There, we have done the technical announcement. I've talked about three books, and now we're going to talk about presidents. We begin with William McKinley, and we finish with Herbert Hoover. We go from the very end of the 19th century into the Great Depression with these presidents. And it is interesting in that this is specifically the epoch where America exerts itself on the world stage. There have been individual moments and incidents where the U.S. has done stuff before, but now it becomes a matter of policy and a matter of dedication to expanding the reach and the influence of the United States. And some of the presidents we're going to talk about today very much, it's very important to them. We're also going to see that in certain places, the Congress is willing to go along, and in certain places, the Congress is not. And when I say the Congress, that's because, of course, there are um, two houses in our, in our National Congress, but usually that, what that really means is the Senate, because the way our Constitution is constructed, it's the Senate that has advice and consent approval, the ability to approve treaties, et cetera. That being the case, I want to read to you two paragraphs from Beschloss in his overall introduction to the book. The first paragraph is going to relate to some people we covered last session, and then the second paragraph will relate more to the people of today. Here we go. It was in 1888 that the widely read British scholar and diplomat, James Bryce wrote, why great men are not chosen as US presidents. Andrew Johnson had been impeached. Ulysses Grant administration had been entangled in scandal. Uh, Rutherford B. Hayes uh, tried to restore the office, but uh, he was constrained by the way he took the presidency. James Garfield was murdered after a year and a half. Chester Arthur and Benjamin Harrison were only too happy to allow Congress to take the driver's seat. Grover Cleveland tried to strengthen the presidency, but he was frustrated. And there was also, if you remember from our last session, that uh, terrible financial panic where the U.S. almost went bankrupt and was saved by J.P. Morgan, something that didn't make Cleveland very happy, but at least it kept the, com the country solvent. Um, as you read about those presidents, you might well ask yourself whether America could have been a greater country during this era had it benefited from a stronger executive leadership. Or was this a period in which the nation, after the greatest crisis in its history, the Civil War, had to lick its wounds and consolidate? Then on the eve of the 20th century, the wheel turned again. With the Spanish-American War and his dispatch of 5,000 Americans to fight the boxers in China, William McKinley heralded America's new role as a world power. Theodore Roosevelt and after the William Howard Taft interlude, Woodrow Wilson, expanded presidential powers over foreign policy and our economic life. Presidencies of Warren Harding and Calvin Coolidge were largely a rebuke to the powerful presidency, but Herbert Hoover, far more than most people understood at the time, 
was a forerunner of the dramatic surge in presidential authority that began in 1933. 1933, of course, is the election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So generally speaking, if we take all of these presidents as a group, <clears throat> they accomplish two things. They expand the impact of the US presidency on our system of governance, and they expand the impact of the United States in world affairs. And even though that takes place when Franklin Roosevelt becomes president, the strength of the presidency is gonna accelerate even more. But we'll save that for chapter five. That's what takes place with this grouping of presidents. We start with William McKinley, former governor of Ohio. He was elected to two terms, but he only served a few months of his second term because he was assassinated. When he was assassinated, his vice president, Theodore Roosevelt, became president, and Theodore Roosevelt would end up serving about seven and a half years as our president, the end of the McKinley term, and then he's elected to one term on his own. So McKinley is twice elected, but serves one full term and then a few months. McKinley is a bit of an enigma. Uh, many historians who write about McKinley put him into a category with Dwight Eisenhower, who we haven't talked about yet, uh, we will later. And uh, th the category they put them in is that as a personality, as a person, he seemed affable, he seemed easygoing, he didn't seem like he was a policy wonk, he didn't push things very hard visibly, but under the, under the scenery or behind the scenes, if you will, he was very, very forceful for what he thought he needed to, but he tried to project a calmer image. There are a group of historians who believe that Eisenhower managed in a similar way. We'll hold the Eisenhower story because that's for a later episode. So McKinley uh, takes office. He is a Republican. So of course he is concerned about, um, he's concerned about the economy more than anything else. And he becomes uh, president, raises tariffs, thinks that's good for the economy. And early on, he is presented with, if you will, an opportunity. Now, when I say opportunity, we are talking about the beginning of imperialism. When I say imperialism, and we're going to talk a lot about that with Theodore Roosevelt, imperialism is easily defined. Imperialism is where a national leader says, if this policy is good for the US, it's good for the world, live with it. And in a simple term, that's imperialism. Those of you who also uh, look for lessons in history, let me actually, since it's right next to me, let me show you a fourth book. Uh, and this book is called uh, Destined for War by Graham Allison, which I've almost finished reading and it's fascinating. This is the gentleman who talks about the Thucydides trap what happens when there is an existing power and a rising power, what happens? The current context of that, of course, is the US and China. But he goes back and talks about the behavior of first William McKinley and then Theodore Roosevelt in terms of wanting to establish the US as a predominant power. Now, one could argue at the time that the predominant power in the world was Great Britain, arguably. Uh, certainly Russia had some power, but not on a world scope. Germany had some power, not in the world scope. It was probably Great Britain, but the U.S. was rising. And McKinley and Roosevelt after him both think about that and write about that and say, we need to project power. Both of them recognize that the way to project power in 1890s, 1900s, 1910s, the way to project power is with the Navy. And it is McKinley who begins the process of building up our Navy. Now, turns out that Theodore Roosevelt during McKinley's first term is the secretary of the Navy. So Roosevelt is certainly in support of that. Roosevelt, by the way, when we have the Spanish-American War, resigns that role, gets himself a commission and leads the Rough Riders up San Juan Hill. When McKinley runs for his second term, Roosevelt is brought in as vice president which is why when McKinley dies, Roosevelt becomes vice president. He was not vice president during McKinley's first term. But McKinley sees that having a strong Navy is important. And he tells the Congress that the budget needs to reflect that so America can 
exercise more of its power. He also becomes aware, McKinley does, that there are a couple of possessions, call them colonies, there's other words you can use, around the world that are kind of vulnerable because the Spanish empire, such as it was, is nearing collapse. And although technically Spain is in charge of the Philippines and in charge of Cuba and in charge of Guam and Puerto Rico for that matter, uh, they, they aren't really a strong and assertive power anymore. So there is an opportunity to do some work there. One of the stories that relates to McKinley has to do with a circulation war that was going on in New York City. There were two papers, one owned by Pulitzer, one owned by Hearst, and they were in a war for circulation. And both of them found that one way to increase circulation was to print stories about the possibility of a war with Spain, the advisability of a war with Spain. Uh, why should Cuba, who's only a few miles off of our coast, be controlled by European power that flies in the face of the Monroe Doctrine, and we should not allow that to happen? And very much there was a drumbeat for us to find a reason to fight against Spain. On the surface, McKinley didn't react very much about that. We now know underneath that McKinley thought that that was a very reasonable thing, that not only should we control Cuba, but the Philippines also looked like they had real potential. Sometimes Americans think of ourselves as never having been a colonial power. I mean, we were a colony of Great Britain, right? But they often say, well, we were never a colonial power like Great Britain, and that's, that's not exactly true. Uh, when we take control of the Philippines after the Spanish-American War, we're gonna hold on to those essentially until after World War II. We're going to fight popular insurrections to, to try to oust us from control of the Philippines because we regard that essentially as our colony. And McKinley thought that that was absolutely and perfectly okay to do that because he wanted to exert more power and he thought the US deserved it because of our size and our strength. Having then defeated Spain in the Spanish-American War, San Juan Hill, Rough Riders, all that stuff. Having defeated Spain, and Spain didn't have much of a military to fight us with, by the way. McKinley wanted to do two things. First of all, he wanted to uh, educate the people in the Philippines. They were essentially illiterate. So on the positive side, he made sure through his representative, William Howard Taft, who would be the president who would succeed Roosevelt, that an education system was put in place in the Philippines. Now that's a good thing because even though we treated them as a colony and they weren't independent, trying to increase educational level of citizens is certainly a good thing. The thing that he did though, which strikes us as, as perhaps not so good, was he decided that the Philippines needed to be Christianized. He didn't think that there were enough Christians in the Philippines. And so he told Taft to be sure to support missionaries, the Catholic church, et cetera, so that the Philippines could be both educated and religious as defined by McKinley. So that's what he did. That's what happened. Uh, Taft turned out to be a very, very effective governor, given the fact that this was a colony and they weren't allowed independence. He was very effective at doing those sorts of things. There is a very, by the way, speaking of Taft, we're going to mention him briefly in a, in a moment. Uh, Taft has the all time record and may it never be broken uh, that he is or was the heaviest president in U.S. history. And yes, the story about him getting stuck in the bathtub in the White House is true. Yes, he was that big. And yes, he got stuck in the bathtub. Okay, so, but in any case, he also was a very efficient administrator for the Philippines, both in education as well as religious conversion, because that's what McKinley told him to do, a very interesting impact on them. The shift in foreign policy then was fairly well complete. We now had fought a European power. Uh, we hadn't really done that since the Revolutionary War. We defeated them. We expanded our territory. And now we had colonies just like all of those countries in Europe did. Now, Europe only paid attention to us to a degree because to a large degree, it was still Great Britain, France, and what is becoming Germany as it 
coalesces into a single country, were still the principal focus points within Europe. But there was some acknowledgement that the US Navy was growing and could be causing a bit of a problem for European control over all of their colonies. That's not something that um, McKinley spent any time being concerned about at all. He was swept to victory uh, when he ran for re-election. His first election campaign was a narrow victory. He was swept to victory. He was powerful. He expressed U.S. values. He expanded us on the world stage. And you may have noticed that in the last 10 minutes or so, I really didn't mention the U.S. Congress very much. That's because he didn't really care about the U.S. Congress terribly much, other than they had to approve our involvement in the Spanish-American War. And at that point, uh, the nation had had its blood up because we had uh, the U.S. Maine had blown up on Havana Harbor, and it clearly was those nasty folks from Spain. By the way, it blew up because there was a problem in the boiler. There was never a torpedo or a mine that blew it up, but that's just facts that got in the way of things. So we fought the war. We expanded our control. Europe took attention. Harding gets credit. It is unlikely that Harding's second term would have been very different from Roosevelt's first term, other than the two of them were very different personalities. So we're into the 20th century now, and Harding gets, pardon me, McKinley, not Harding, I'm sorry. McKinley gets credit for launching what many historians call the American century. And he gets credit for doing that. He's assassinated in Buffalo, New York, and uh, Teddy Roosevelt becomes our president. Roosevelt, I have come to believe, studying presidents for many years, um, actually had attention deficit disorder. He, he really did. He couldn't sit still. He couldn't just focus on one thing. He had to be doing multiple things. He had to be in motion. He had to be everywhere, doing everything all at the same time. His energy level was exceptional. His um, daughter, uh, Alice, is famous for her description of her father uh, when she said that uh, he always wanted to be the bride at every wedding, uh, the baby at every christening, and the deceased at every funeral. So if you think about that, pretty much that means he would be the center of attention the entire time. But there's more to that that's just anecdotal. There's more to that, and it is that not only did uh, Theodore Roosevelt not pay too much attention to the Congress of the U.S., he pretty much ignored it and ran over it with the exception of when he needed to do something specific. For example, the legislation to create the Food and Drug Administration, which came from Roosevelt, he needed to have the Congress pass that, so we told him what they would do. The people who were leading the Congress and the Senate at that particular point, by and large, went along with what he was told, or when they found out they had been duped, there wasn't a whole lot that they could do about it. What would an example of that look like? We started, we, the United States, started the construction of the Panama Canal while the U.S. Senate was still debating whether it was a good idea. And Roosevelt said, let them talk, I'm digging. And he did. Now, technically, he was doing that without approval, which he needed. That didn't really stop Roosevelt terribly much. Roosevelt was a person who had a couple of very strong beliefs. First, he strongly believed in Christian civilization, so he can he strongly supported what had been done in the Philippines with the making sure that they all became Christians. Number two, he was a strong believer in naval power, and he took the start of the expansion of the U.S. Navy and expanded it even further than that. Third, he strongly believed that the uh, Monroe Doctrine was appropriate. Now, the Monroe Doctrine, 1823, President Monroe and Secretary of State John Quincy Adams write this document that says to the countries of Europe, stay out of the Western Hemisphere, the U.S. is in charge. Now, I just summarized what it said, but that's essentially what it meant. In terms of an act of imperialism, it's hard to get beyond the Monroe Doctrine. But strangely, the Monroe Doctrine became a justification of many elements of our foreign policy. When John Kennedy gives his famous speech in 1962 about the Cuban Missile Crisis, he references the Monroe Doctrine as a reason for that. And Roosevelt uses it as well. 
There was a problem with finances in Venezuela, which sounds awfully contemporary. There was a problem with finances in Venezuela. They were overextended to some European banks and they weren't paying their debts. So the European banks complained to their governments and a couple of countries in Europe sent their Navy to the coast of Venezuela and said, either uh, you pay what you owe us or we will uh, bomb your harbors and take them over and use them to extract some form of payment. Roosevelt contacts the leaders of those European countries and says, if you try to do that, I'm sending down the US Navy and you're gonna have to go to war with me. The European boats backed up and sailed back to Europe. Now, that's pretty strong diplomacy stuff, but very consistent with what Roosevelt believed in a very strong executive branch that takes charge and makes sure that the U.S. is a world leader. Roosevelt wrote extensively about the fact, I'm gonna summarize some of his writings now, I'm gonna paraphrase and not quote. And what he said was, we're at the dawn of a new century. The new century has all of these possibilities in front of us. And if the U.S. does not go and grab those possibilities and take advantage of them, some other power will, and we will be left in the dust. So we have to, to recognize our destiny, we have to seize those opportunities, and we can't just sit and wait. It is not good for the American spirit. We have conquered the entire continent, essentially by then, we've conquered the entire continent, and now we need to make an impression on the world. He didn't ask the world if the rest of the world thought this was a good idea. He didn't ask the countries of South America, other than Venezuela in this one case, uh, did they like the Monroe Doctrine? And the fact is that the nations of South America, by and large, didn't like the Monroe Doctrine. They said it was paternalistic, it was autocratic. And who is the United States to tell us, the sovereign nations of South America, that we shouldn't be in charge of our own fate and our own destiny? Roosevelt really didn't hear them because for him, the United States had to um, increase its impact in the world. Otherwise, other nations would get ahead of us and we would be left behind. In addition to that, inside the country, he became involved in uh, what had been called at the time trust busting, we would call it antitrust now, uh, where he thought that, two, that some companies and some industries were getting monopolistic control and he went after them. It was pointed out to him that the things he was talking about and advocating really weren't mentioned in the constitution for the executive branch. His response paraphrased was, I don't care. I'm the president, I'm elected by the people and I am going to be involved in these things because it's good for the country. Step back for a second and think about that reasoning. I am doing this because it's good for the country. In whose opinion? Well, in my opinion, it's good for the country. But the Constitution says, you know, Mr. Chief Executive, or Ms. Chief Executive at some point in the future, um, we have these limitations about what you can do there in the executive branch, and maybe you're going a bit beyond them. Uh, it didn't seem to cause him particular problem. There was one example which, which brings this very, makes this very, very clear. In 1902, the United Mine Workers struck Mine working conditions were awful. Six day weeks, 12 hour days, lots of accidents, conditions were awful. And uh, John L. Lewis was just getting started with US mine workers and he managed to get a strike called uh, late summer, early fall, 1902. Now coal at that point uh, was what the nation ran on was coal. And that's what we heated our homes with was coal. So if there is a coal strike, that would not be good for the economy. Well. Um, the people who owned the mines were in every way you could define it, uh, a monopoly. They owned the, the companies that owned the mines also owned the railroads that brought the coal to the cities and they owned the distribution companies in the cities that brought the coal to your home. So pretty much they controlled the complete supply chain in today's terms and could set prices that were quite beneficial to all members of the supply chain. And here come the United Mine Workers, still getting organized, uh, saying, you know, we, we need better working conditions. And the owners of the mines decided 
that uh, they were just going to sit and wait until the mine workers ran out of money in their strike fund and had to go back to work. And then they would go back to work and go from there. Roosevelt saw the possibility of the nation running out of coal in the northeast quadrant of the US. It would be very, very cold without coal. And he said that really wasn't uh, satisfactory to him. So he called the owners of the mines to the White House for a meeting. And he said, okay, I need to get involved in this discussion. Now, the owners of the mine said, you don't really have the authority to get involved in this labor dispute. He said, I know, but you know, I wanna to talk to you and express my point of view. So they came. And once they're in the White House, he said, just a minute, he went in the next room and he brought in the representatives of the United Mine Workers. The, the owners didn't know they were there, by the way. So they walk into the room and sit down. Roosevelt said, okay, now that I brought you guys together, we're gonna to start negotiating and I'm gonna help out. And of course, it, now it, with an even louder voice, the leaders, the owners of the mine said, you can't do that. To which Roosevelt said, yes, I can, because I am the voice of the people. I am avoiding a national catastrophe, which is not having enough coal. And we are going to reach an agreement. Now the agreement didn't happen that day, but the mine owners agreed to binding arbitration because of pressure from Roosevelt. What, by the way, was the Congress doing during this time? Pretty much just watching the show. This was a Roosevelt thing to do this. And the binding arbitration was accepted by the union and the miners got the best contract they had ever had up until that point. In today's standards, it wasn't much of a contract, but it was still a whole lot better. The strike was averted and Roosevelt had further increased the power of the presidency. He also was looking overseas. And when he looks overseas, he says, you know what? We need to do better in terms of world economy and world trade and making sure that there isn't um, waste in the world because of warfare. And he turns his attentions to two things that no previous president had ever even thought of doing. The first is the Panama Canal. And although nations of the world had known for decades that a Panama Canal would certainly make it a little easier to get from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And although of course, France had tried to build a canal and, and failed miserably, the United States said um, to project ourselves and to do good for our economy and the world's economy, we're gonna build the canal. And we did. And to build the canal, we created the country of Panama. So you've got the Philippines, which we won by virtue of a war, right? And we took, they became the colony of us here in Spain. But we created the country of Panama. The Isthmus of Panama was part of Colombia. We supported insurgents from the Colombian political group who went over to Panama and created a country in return for US support for their revolution. We said, sure. So they declared the independent sovereign nation of Panama. And then when Colombia got upset because they, Colombia thought it was part of Colombia and they sent an army over, they found out that the US had sent down its Navy, its gunboats and the US Marines to support Panama, the newly independent Panama, so that we could build the canal. And sure enough, Panama signed an agreement right away saying, sure, build a canal right through our country. That's perfectly fine. We, we enjoy that. Colombian army marched back to Colombia, we created the country of Panama. Now, there's no question that the world benefited from the canal. There is no question that given the engineering knowledge in the world at the time, that likely the US was the best place to be able to fund and focus on that project, but how we went about it was pure imperialism. And then we look at the Sino-Japanese War. Russia and Japan uh, got into a war uh, having to do with Manchuria. Now, this was the very, very start of Japan deciding that it needed to expand beyond its islands because it needed resources, which Japan doesn't have natural resources. Japan doesn't have a lot. And it needed some space for its people. This was the very start of what would lead to what's later called the um, Asian uh, Economic Prosperity Zone, I believe, which is the phrase that Japan uses just before World War II to um, explain why it's taking over China and Southeast Asia, et cetera. But in any case, they went to war with Russia 
over Manchuria. Roosevelt determines that this isn't good for world trade. After all, we were doing a lot of trade with Japan. That's going to get in the way. And Russia is partly a European country, too. And Europe was already starting to show some stress because of what Germany was doing. So Roosevelt concluded, you know what? We need to have a peace conference. So Roosevelt inserted himself and said to the two warring countries, you need to, to come here to the US and I'm gonna help you negotiate a settlement. And he did. And Theodore Roosevelt wins the Nobel Peace Prize. Roosevelt Peace Prize is not something which you would normally think of in, in correlation, but it happened because that's what he did. No US president had ever tried to do anything like that before, but to Roosevelt, it made perfect sense because the US was showing how important it was on the world stage. He was easily reelected for a second term. He was extremely popular and he continues in the second term to do the sort of stuff he was doing in the first term. He goes after more uh, what they call trusts at the time and he doesn't really pay a whole lot of attention to what the Congress is or isn't doing. Uh, people out, uh, outside the executive branch call them the cowboy in the White House, uh, the person who uh, would ride around and do stuff and not consult. But the Congress didn't really try to push back either. And Roosevelt was the first truly imperial president. You could argue that Lincoln was within war powers. Maybe you could argue that. But in terms of the imperial presidency, which is pretty much what we have now, it's Roosevelt who said, this is what I do. This is how important the U.S. is. Live with it. And pretty much the world did. When Roosevelt ran for re-election, he promised the United States not re-election, let me correct that. When he ran on his own to become president for his own four-year term, he promised the American people he would not run for re-election. He would not run for an elected second term. So he handpicked William Howard Taft, former governor of the Philippines, to be the Republican candidate. He made sure the party was behind Taft, and Taft rolled into office with Roosevelt's full and complete support. Now we have a bit of a disconnect inside presidential politics. Roosevelt selected Taft because he believed that Taft would listen to Roosevelt's counsel, even though Roosevelt would have no formal role. He wasn't in the cabinet. He obviously wasn't vice president. So he thought that Taft would listen to him. They had been friends for 20 years. Taft had followed his guidance. Well, Taft followed his guidance because he had, you know, Roosevelt had been president. But when Taft got into office, he had some of his own ideas about what governance looked like. One of the things that he did, because he was a better administrator, was that he said to the Congress, you know what, we, we have to do a little better working together. So he started to open up the, the pathways of communication with the Congress. He did not want to be an imperial president. Matter of fact, he believed much more in consensus. Um, of all of the writings I've ever read uh, that uh, Roosevelt wrote, I don't think I've ever seen the word consensus. But Taft was much more comfortable with that. Now remember, Taft is going to go on to become Chief Justice of the Supreme Court with his legalistic mind and trying to build consensus. That's a reasonably good job for him. And he was reasonably good in terms of being the uh, person in charge of the Philippines, given the fact that the Philippines was not an independent country. Uh, he reduced tariffs. Uh, he enforced antitrust legislation. He uh, thought that the uh, conservatives in his party were too conservative. They were too hawkish. And he thought that we should be better citizens of the world. And while Taft is doing all of this, kind of reducing the strength of the presidency a bit and kind of pulling back from what Roosevelt had done. Roosevelt became increasingly angry at Taft because he wasn't a mini Roosevelt. Actually, he wasn't a mini anything, but he certainly wasn't following in Roosevelt's footsteps. This made Roosevelt 
angry. And Roosevelt said to the Republican Party, I said I wasn't going to run in 1908, and I did not. But all bets are off for 1912. And Roosevelt sets up a extremely important presidential election, which is the election of 1912. We need to stop for a few minutes and talk about this. This is one of those historical moments where the history of our country could have gone in any number of directions at this point. We have three major candidates for the presidency. First, there is Taft, the incumbent president. Taft says to the leaders of the Republican Party, I would like to run for a second term. And the leaders of the Republican Party, having no reason not to support him, said fine. Now, there was a series of primaries, 12 to be exact, but the primary system was very different than it is now. Yes, people voted in primaries, but the convention was still decided by the political party elite. I mean, there were some votes from the primaries, but it was the political party elite. It was the big cigars and the smoky rooms in the back who actually made the decision. So there's 12 primaries. And Theodore Roosevelt, who wants the Republican nomination, and the leaders of the Republican Party say no, says, OK, I'll take my case to the people. There are 12 primaries. Roosevelt wins 10 of them. One might call that momentum. But when the convention takes place, the Republican leaders look at Taft, who they can work with, and they look at Roosevelt, who they had difficulty working with, and said, you know what? We're going to stick with the incumbent, and we're going to give him our endorsement. And Roosevelt becomes so very angry at this that rather than support his longtime friend Taft, he says, well, in that case, I'm going to form my own party. And he forms what was technically called the Progressive Party. Not quite progressive as we define it today, but that was the name of the party. People think it was the Bull Moose Party. And it really wasn't the Bull Moose Party. That was the symbol of the party, because if ever a president was a Bull Moose, it was Roosevelt. So that became the hood ornament, if you will, of his party. It was a progressive party and Roosevelt campaigned for the presidency. The Democrats nominate Woodrow Wilson, former president of Princeton, former governor of New Jersey, and not a particularly likable man. Uh, first of all, he is a racist. And I absolutely mean that and specifically what the word racist means. He was a racist. If you study Woodrow Wilson, you'll know that's the case. Um, besides being a racist, he also believed in segregation in this country. Now, of course, we're talking about 1912, so the country is pretty segregated, but he was a full supporter of that. And he was uh, not a person who probably would have generated a victory on his own, but here's what happened in the polls. Roosevelt and Taft split the Republican vote. There's nothing to split for Woodrow Wilson. So although he gets a minority of the popular vote, he gets a majority of the electoral vote because Taft and Roosevelt split the popular vote and the remaining votes in the Electoral College. Had either Taft or Roosevelt decided not to run, and all those votes went to the other Republican candidate, which is a reasonable expectation, Woodrow Wilson would not have been elected. And in all likelihood, Theodore Roosevelt would have come back as our president and become the second president to have non-consecutive terms in office. The first to recall was Grover Cleveland. But that's not what happened. Roosevelt was extremely frustrated. Uh, he essentially left politics after that. And then after his uh, oldest son was killed in World War I, he pretty much went into severe mourning and died a few years after that. But the future of the nation would have been very, very different looking at the development of World War I with Roosevelt, the imperialist, the one who wants to express US strength in the White House, when we get to 1914 and World War I starts, would we have spent three years out of World War I with Theodore Roosevelt as president? Highly unlikely. Now, all historians have to be really careful because you can't rewrite history. You can't, you know, you can't go back and what if, what if, what if, what if, what if. You, 
doesn't go anywhere. But I think it is safe to say that had Taft backed away from running for office, because Roosevelt, by the way, finished second in the voting, and had Roosevelt therefore won the election, which is likely, when World War II, World War I, pardon me, broke out in 1914, I am quite certain we would have been involved quite promptly. That would have changed the arc of our history and Europe's history in a number of ways. Having acknowledged that, that's not what happened. So end of fantasy. And let's go back to what really occurred. Woodrow Wilson becomes our president. Taft, as I said, is going to end up Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Roosevelt's going to walk away from politics. When presidential ratings first came out, Woodrow Wilson would consistently rank in the top five or the top 10. And as you can see from the document that we posted in chat for you, his ranking has decreased a bit, and I suspect it's going to decrease even further. One, because he was a racist, as, as you know, that was, that was one reason. Um, secondly, uh, because he led in a way that sometimes appeals to true intellects. Now, we don't have IQ tests for every president, and there's no way we ever will be able to do that. We can speculate on our smarter presidents or our not so smart presidents. Um, my personal vote for the smartest president, by the way, uh, is Bill Clinton. That doesn't mean he has, does not mean he has the most common sense. Anybody who does the New York Times crossword puzzle every Sunday and created puzzles for the New York Times for their readers is a smart person. Common sense, that's a, that's a different issue. But Woodrow Wilson and John Quincy Adams in all likelihood would be the other two of our most intellectually capable president. Let's focus on Wilson. Wilson, however, was not quite a born politician. He was an effective speaker. All the reports about his speaking ability were, uh, were very, very positive, his ability to deliver his speech. But he had a weakness that sometimes intellects have, and it goes like this. He would say, I have created this idea, whatever the idea is, policy idea, whatever. I've created this idea. And because I'm smart and because I created the idea, you should agree because I'm right. Just admit that I'm right. We'll save a lot of time and let's go on with whatever we're doing. Well, that's not the way you persuade people. That's the way that you try to belittle people. That's the way that you appear, oh, a little pompous, a little hubristic, if you behave like that. But Wilson often did because he said, uh, this is the best idea. It's mine. And that's what we should do. So from the beginning, although he knew that he had to work with Congress, he became actually the first person to appear in front of a joint session of Congress to give a speech since John Adams, kind of surprising, because he knew that he needed their support. But in terms of the give and take, which is how successful politics work, you give little, I give little, we compromise, we each make some progress, and we call it a victory. That was not something that Wilson was quite willing to do. Compromise was not strong for him. He believed that if it was his idea, then that's what he should do. So he suggests a whole lot of legislation to Congress. But instead of doing what Lyndon Johnson would do when Johnson became president before the albatross of Vietnam pulled Johnson down, Johnson would, would talk to the congressional leaders and say, okay, here's some legislation I would like, the direction I want to go in. What's practical? What can you give me? What do you need for me? Let's get it, you know, let's move it along a bit. And Johnson was very successful. He worked with Congress. Woodrow Wilson talked to Congress or talked down to Congress. It's not the same as working with Congress. And as he did that during his first term, he started to make an enemy. Now, political enemies, sometimes important, sometimes not. This political enemy becomes important. His name is Henry Cabot Lodge. Uh, you know his son because his son was Nixon's VP running mate in 1960, and then later our ambassador to Vietnam. In any case, his father, Henry Cabot Lodge, was a senator from Massachusetts. He was the majority leader in the Senate. And Henry Cabot Lodge very, very much believed 
in consultation with the Senate. Taft had been willing to do that and pretty much Lodge thought that was the proper approach. Wilson, not so much. So Wilson suggested a whole lot of very, very good uh, legislation, uh, reform in the banking system, the financial system, uh, the proposal of the Federal Reserve Act, uh, the Clayton Antitrust Act, uh, child labor laws. There's a whole lot of, of legislation coming out of Wilson's office. But the Congress was going, particularly the Senate was going, you haven't consulted with us? You haven't asked our opinion? You haven't asked how to get this stuff passed? You just keep saying, here, here, do approve this one, prove that one. And the Senate in particular started to resist. They started significantly changing the legislation that the president had suggested. This made Wilson angry. And he said, well, I'm, I'm just going to have to, you know, if, if you don't approve the stuff the way that I, that I give it to you, then I'm going to have to find other means. That would mean, you know, executive actions or executive orders. We're all familiar with what those are these days. By the time that the legislation would pass, it often would be significantly different than what Wilson wanted. But Lodge was smart enough to make sure that the Congress was capable of overriding any veto from Wilson. So Wilson's experience with Congress wasn't too good. We get to 1914 and the war breaks out in Europe, what is going to be World War I. And Wilson decides early on that we are going to be neutral. He says it is a European war. Now, by the way, it was not a European war because the war was also fought, World War I I'm talking about, in Africa and in Southeast Asia because European countries had colonies in those areas and there was fighting going on between armies of the European countries in the colonies. There was a lot of fighting in Africa in World War I and a lot of fighting in Southeast Asia between European nations. So was it a world war? You could argue that it was very much a world war. We said we are going to be neutral. We are not going to get involved. As a matter of fact, when Wilson runs for re-election in 1916, his platform, his number one plank in his platform was vote for Wilson. He has kept us out of the war. Now in the US, there was a whole lot of sentiment for Germany, a lot of German Americans. There was sentiment for France and sentiment for England, but the German Americans are really vocal and they were supportive of German war aims in that war. However, that's not exactly what happened. And there are two reasons. Well, actually, there yeah, there's two reasons. That's a fair way to describe it. First was the Zimmerman telegram. That is where a representative of Germany uh, actually sent a telegram to the leadership of Mexico, suggesting that if Mexico would come in on the side of Germany and invade the Southwest United States, Texas, Arizona, uh, to reclaim some of the land that we had taken back in the, in the Mexican-American War, Germany would help them in that effort against the United States. Well, that didn't, that didn't set too well when we read that. And then the uh, Germans made a tactical mistake because they approved unconditional submarine warfare in the Atlantic. If it's a boat and it's not our boat, we may sink it. And they started sinking things like the Lusitania. A lot of Americans died on the Lusitania. And the support that had been a lot of German support, remember, and a lot of not so vocal support for France and Britain started to change. And now the support for those two countries became stronger and not so much for Germany because they had hurt us. So in a short period of time, we reelect Wilson in November of 1916. He is sworn in for office in March of 1917. And in April of 1917, Wilson says, I'd like a declaration of war from the Congress. At that point, America was ready to go to war because they perceived that Germany was acting against their interests. It was approved and we came in on the side of the Allies. Now, there's a couple of sub stories going on here and it has to do with the presidency and with particularly the Senate. Here's the first sub story. It is absolutely correct that based on the timing 
of the U.S. becoming involved in World War I, we saved France. That is a fact. It goes like this. Russia was involved in World War I. Russia decided after it had the communist revol Bolshevik revolution that it was silly to stay in the war because resources had to be invested in Russia. So Russia and Germany agreed to what amounted to a peace treaty. Because the peace treaty, Russia removes its soldiers from what was the um, Eastern Front. And those German soldiers were then redeployed to the Western Front, which was in France. The soldiers are being redeployed, which would change the military balance in France at about the same time that the American soldiers were arriving in force. So when Blackjack Pershing gets there and we fight the battles of Cantini and Bellow Wood, et cetera, the difference in Allied victory was because of the preponderance of U.S. troops changing the balance of power to the Allies. That's the reason that World War I ended because the U.S. got involved when they did. Remembering what I had said before, it would have looked very different had Theodore Roosevelt been president because I suspect we would have been involved in the war despite the German-American voice a whole lot sooner. In any case, we became involved in the war and we were the difference causing the temporary end of the war because the armistice is a temporary end. So did Wilson do a good thing? Well, you could argue that he did. He made the world in his terms safe for democracy, which is a phrase we'll investigate in the last two sessions of this series. And the um, World War I ended and the peace conference started, which became the Treaty of Versailles eventually. And Wilson goes over to Europe. He says, well, uh, we were a major contributor to the victory and we're gonna go. Now, the fact is that we were a major contributor in the last 25% of the war. The first 75% of the war was pretty much fought by Great Britain and France. A uh, little Italy was kind of an ally, sort of kind of. But those two countries, they were the ones who suffered for three years. And although we made the difference in the last year in terms of troop strength, they had a whole lot of dead people because of their three-year involvement. So Wilson goes over and he is greeted as a hero in Europe. There are parades for him, the equivalent of ticker tape parades. He is the savior of Europe because of the American troops. He's hailed as a hero, except by the leaders of Great Britain and France who think he's a Johnny come lately who is trying to get some sort of advantage. They don't really want to listen to him. And then Wilson makes it worse. Remember, Wilson is the intellect. And Wilson says, well, it's my idea, so it must be good because it's my idea. So when Wilson gets to Europe, he's bringing with him the 14 points. What are the 14 points? It is Wilson's picture of how the world should govern itself, conduct foreign policy, create the League of Nations, and never have war again. He didn't consult with the leaders of Great Britain or France. He said, well, it's my idea. It's going to be good. So why don't you agree with it? He also didn't consult with the U.S. Senate. Now, remember I used the word treaty. Well, a treaty per the Constitution says that the president is our chief foreign policy officer. He negotiates, negotiates a treaty. But the treaty has to be approved by the U.S. Senate. And if it's not approved by the U.S. Senate, it's not a treaty regardless of what a president may have promised. So here's Wilson in Europe. He assumes that since the 14 points in the League of Nations were his ideas, that everyone's going to agree. He spends no time trying to build communication back with the U.S. Senate. And the leaders of the European countries look at him and go, you are way too idealistic. And they pretty much put him in a room by himself as they complete the negotiations, which include the incredible war reparations that Germany has to pay, the agreement that by Germany that they caused the war, Germany giving up all of their colonies in Africa and Southeast Asia. By the way, the colonies didn't become independent countries. They became colonies of the victorious European countries, not, you know, not independent countries. But all those things that Germany had to go through, 
while Wilson is fine-tuning the 14 points. The only part of the 14 points that really works its way into reality is the League of Nations, which was created and lasted for a few years until pretty much the start of World War II and then the League of Nations for practical purposes disappeared at that point. So was Wilson successful while he was in Europe? Not really. He got the League of Nations, but he didn't get most of the 14 points brought into part of the Treaty of Versailles. He sails back to the US and he has two surprises when he gets back to the US. The first surprise is that he finds women having uh, chained themselves to the um, gates of the White House. Seems that there was this real big push for women's suffrage while he was in Europe. Uh, the push of the suffragettes was, um, how can you be in Europe saying that you are for democracy when you don't allow women in this country to vote? Kind of a strong argument. And when Wilson gets back, he realizes that he can't fight all the suffragettes in the US. And suddenly he flips. He had been against women voting before he left for Europe, by the way. He now changes his mind and says, wow, I guess that's a good idea. And he gets out of the way and we get the amendment that allow women to vote. But more importantly, in terms of the dialogue about presidents, more importantly, he goes to the US Senate and he says, okay, I've negotiated the Treaty of Versailles, includes the League of Nations, and I want you to approve it. And Henry Cabot Lodge sits down with him and says, no. Lodge says, you didn't consult with us. You didn't ask our opinion. You didn't ask what's important to us. And as a matter of fact, there are a number of issues in what you propose for us to sign that we disagree with. So we are now going to discuss it and we're going to amend it and then we will present it back to you because you have to go back to the European nations that signed it and say, well, we have a few changes that the US Senate required. Wilson said, I'm not gonna change it, it's perfect. Lodge said, well, you don't have to change it, but then you're not gonna get it approved. And that is the reason that Wilson started on his nationwide tour on a train to try to convince the American people to put pressure on the Senate to approve the Treaty of Versailles, which, by the way, we aren't going to sign. It is during that trip that Wilson suffers a stroke, which incapacitates him for the rest of his presidency. But Lodge did something which Wilson should have been smart enough to tell. The Senate has to be on board to approve a treaty. Getting the Senate involved in the process is a good idea. Now, we've seen this more recently in our politics. And an example, this isn't a parallel, it's just an illustrative example, has to do with President Obama and the Iran nuclear deal or the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, because that title makes sense, the Iran nuclear deal. Obama negotiates it on behalf of the US. He signs it on behalf of the US as an executive agreement not as a treaty, because if he wanted it to be a treaty, he would have to go back to the US Senate, controlled by Republicans at the time, and say, I've negotiated this thing with Iran and I want you to approve it. What's the likelihood that the Senate would have approved it? Very little, actually zero, that they would have approved it. The result of the fact that it was not a treaty meant that the next president in office could say, we are out of that executive agreement. It's not a treaty. A president cannot on his or her own authority remove us from a treaty. It requires the action of the Senate again, but the Senate never acted. So the next president could remove us because it wasn't a treaty. So there's Wilson. All of this effort into the Treaty of Versailles, the League of Nations, and he kind of forgot the US Senate. He was reminded that perhaps he should have spent more time with the US Senate, and perhaps he should have spent more time politicking inside the US. He finishes his term in office. He is still, he isn't an invalid, but he never regains full use of all of his, of his physiology. And he leaves the stage and the nation elects Warren G. Harding, 
Harding was a very affable politician. Uh, he loved to dress up in costume. He loved to shake hands. He loved to smoke cigars. Uh, let's just say he wasn't the smartest card in the deck would probably be fair. But the U.S. people voted for him in part because there was a reaction against Wilson because the, the, the thought pattern was that we, the president, had spent way too much time focused on foreign affairs during his second term in office, not domestic affairs, and we wanted someone who was going to be calm and easygoing and not care so much about what happened overseas. And so we elected Warren G. Harding. Harding said, well, I'm not even gonna try to convince you to sign that League of Nations thing because it was a bad agreement, so we're not even gonna talk about it anymore. Um, a recession came and Harding didn't really know what to do. He turned to the Congress, uh, tr trying to share the blame apparently, and uh, they didn't have any good ideas either. And he didn't really govern very effectively at all. He's only president for a short period of time, a couple of years. And uh, during those two years, by the way, because he wasn't a very good manager, a whole lot of graft and corruption um, erupted. Uh, the teapot dome scandal erupted. Uh, that was the famous uh, decision by the Secretary of the Interior to take federal land upon which no drilling would be for petroleum would be allowed, but to lease it to a couple of companies uh, to do drilling because they paid him a lot of money under the table that happened during the administration of Harding. And therefore Harding um, dies of a heart attack and that's the end. His role as a president lasted two years. I mention it because we're doing all the presidents in sequence. Did he have any real impact on the presidency? Not really, uh, he just did not. He leaves the scene and his vice president takes over and that's Calvin Coolidge. Now, Calvin Coolidge finishes um, Harding's term which is two years, and then he's elected on his own. So he ends up having approximately six years in office. At the end of Calvin Coolidge's presidency, he was asked by a reporter, what are you proudest of that your administration accomplished? Coolidge's famous response was, I'm proud that we did nothing. He actually said that. What did he mean by that? He said, well, what he meant by that was this. There are things going on in the country. Uh, women can suddenly vote. Uh, we, we passed prohibition. Uh, so, you know, you can't drink and women can vote. Oh my goodness. Um, and uh, there's stuff going on in Europe. I don't really care so much. So uh, the, uh, the folks in, in the Senate and House of Representatives seem to be doing their job and pretty much I'm just gonna be a caretaker. Now, caretaker was not a, a phrase that was used at the time of Coolidge, but literally he had no control, no direction over what the country did. Lodge, by the way, is, is still in the Senate, and this is the period of strength for the US Congress. Not that the Congress did much, but they were clearly the leader, the stuff that they passed, Coolidge approved, Coolidge vetoed hardly nothing, hardly anything, pardon me, vetoed hardly anything, he did very few executive orders. Um, he seemed to enjoy being president, um, but beyond that, he doesn't really leave any impact on the nation or the presidency. If you combine Hard, uh, uh, Harding for his couple of years and then Coolidge and for the eight year period of time, uh, what you have in my estimation is a reaction to the very, very outward pushing of U.S. strength, which Woodrow Wilson did in the end of his first term and certainly through his second term. And the nation said, we want to pull back. Congress can be in charge and that's okay. And Coolidge said, that's fine. And at the end of his elected term in office, he didn't even think about running for re-election. So the presidency, if you will, goes through a lull. The lull is going to finish with Herbert Hoover, who, by the way, is then going to be followed by Franklin Roosevelt and followed by Harry Truman. All three presidents, very strong, very executive branch oriented, very much want to do things their own way. We remember two of the presidents positively, Roosevelt and Truman, 
and won negatively, that's Hoover, because Hoover was president when the Great Depression hit. Let's be clear. Herbert Hoover did not cause the Great Depression. Some decisions that Hoover made made the Great Depression worse. That's true. But Congress had a role in them as well. And we'll talk about that joint mistake that they made in just a minute. I'm pulling out the Beschloss book that I'd referenced before. And I wanna read the first couple of paragraphs about Herbert Hoover. By the way, Hoover is a great American. He served his country in a variety of ways and was very helpful uh, after, during and after World War I, after World War II, he was an advisor to Truman. He did a lot of very good things. But the parallel that I see with Hoover is Jimmy Carter. Um, I admire Jimmy Carter more than any other living American. But his presidency was a disaster. Those four years, disaster. Hoover is admirable, but his presidency was also a disaster. Not fully of his own making. Hoover tries to expand and strengthen the executive branch, but it's kind of hard to do that when your GDP drops by 50% and your unemployment goes from 3% to 25% within a year. It's kind of hard to be an effective, forceful leader. In any case, two paragraphs from Beschloss about Hoover. When Herbert Hoover campaigned for the presidency in 1928, he told the nation that he foresaw the end of poverty in the United States, provided, of course, he was elected. He did win the presidency. Oh, by the way, I need to make a parenthetical comment here. His opponent in 1928 was Al Smith from New York, governor of New York. And this is the first time in American presidential politics that a Catholic had received the nomination of a major party. Al Smith was Catholic. And during that election in 1928, there was a whole lot of disgusting rhetoric about the Pope being in control of the US and you can't trust the Catholic. And we're talking about in major media sources, talking about this sort of stuff. And it is one of the reasons that Al Smith lost the election because he was Catholic. And in 1928, apparently the United States wasn't quite ready for that. In any case, back to best laws. Hoover did win the presidency, but the prediction of a poverty-free nation proved illusory. Instead of well-fed Americans driving to good jobs and new cars, by the end of Hoover's term, they stood in bread lines or sold apples on street corners. Instead of purchasing gleaming consumer goods from stores, the unemployed improvised to simply stay alive. The makeshift products, however, did have brand names. Newspapers wrapped around the body for warmth were Hoover blankets. Cars that had broken down and had to be pulled by mule teams were Hoover wagons. The ubiquitous empty pocket turned inside out was a Hoover flag. And unappetizing jackrabbits ew, were called Hoover hogs. Sporting, spotting the nation from coast to coast were compounds of ramshackle shanties made of packing crates, scrap tin, and tar paper built by destitute Americans with nowhere to go. And these little towns were called Hoovervilles. The Great Depression tested Hoover and the beliefs he'd acquired as a youth. One of the great ironies of Hoover's career was that he first made his reputation as someone who brought relief to those who were hungry and starving in Belgium and Russia during and after World War I. Yet, when he faced a similar situation in his presidency, he was incapable of adopting his convictions about individual responsibility and self-reliance to the needs of a national crisis. Hoover did more to fight a depression than any president before him had ever tried to do, but it was not enough to spare him rejection by his fellow citizens in 1932. What did Hoover try to do? Well, he started a works program. What became known as the Hoover Dam was started during Hoover's presidency. There were other major infrastructures that were built. So when we think of Franklin Roosevelt, who leads off our next session in two months, and we think about all the stuff of the, uh, of the New Deal, 
the Works Progress Administration, the Civilian Conservation Corps, Hoover is trying to do some of that too, because he knows Americans want to go to work and want to get paid and don't want a handout. So, so far, so good. But the problem with Hoover was he had a traditional Republican view of the economic process. And the traditional Republican view says, you got to keep a balanced budget. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt is going to blow that theory to pieces, by the way. You got to keep a balanced budget. So as Hoover is saying, you know, we're going to build this stuff, which means the federal government is spending money. Hoover is also saying, but we got to collect taxes to pay for it. Because even though we're doing this over here, we have to keep the budget balanced. Although I am not a fan of the level of federal debt that we currently have. Oh, another parenthetical thing, by the way. The U.S. is about to reach a threshold, which the last time it reached was World War II, and it's not a, a happy threshold. Um, the U.S. sovereign debt is about to exceed our annual GDP. The last time that happened was World War II. We were fighting a war. That was the last time that happened. When we actually exceed our GDP, which will happen sometime soon, we will join other international financial luminaries like Greece and Italy with more debt than annual GDP. This is not a good place to be, by the way. Okay, let's go back to Hoover. So Hoover is trying to balance the budget. That's not working very well. The Democrats in Congress are jumping up and down and they're saying, President, we got to do something. We can't just let the economy stay like this. We have to pass legislation. We have to do stuff. And Hoover said, no, no, we have to wait. So Hoover gives his famous speech on the economy. Now, I don't typically do impressions, and I only do a few, and this is one of them. This is my Herbert Hoover impression of his famous speech that he gave many times after the Great Depression had started. Now, it's really complex, so please pay attention. Here we go. Herbert Hoover's economic speech. The economy goes up, the economy goes down. Right now, it's down. If we wait long enough, it'll go up. If you didn't follow that, you can look at the re review on YouTube and you can see what I just explained. Hoover didn't believe the federal government should take action. It's not listed in the Constitution. It's not Republican orthodoxy of the 1930s. We wait long enough, the Great Depression will go away. The people who were starving in the U.S. and the Democrats in Congress didn't think this was a good idea. So a couple of folks in Congress came up with this wonderful, wonderful idea called the smoot Hawley Tariff. And the tariff basically was based on logic that worked like this. It said, well, you know, we've got a depression. So let's put a tariff in place that makes European goods more expensive because Europe was basically our import source. And that will force people in the U.S. to buy American. Ever heard that before? Right. They'll force people in the U.S. to buy Americans, and we will work our way out of the Great Depression by doing so. Hoover is under pressure now to do something, anything, to show that he wants to help the economy. He receives a letter which is signed by over 1,000 people professors of economics, leaders of U.S. corporations, leaders of the U.S. Congress that say, for God's sake, what we don't want is a tariff. And they explain to Hoover in terms he should have understand that two, there's two problems with a tariff during a depression. Number one, if we put a tariff on European goods that are coming to the U.S., Europe's going to go, aha, I'm going to tariff you back. And the extent to which we have any exports going to Europe are going to face a tariff, so it's going to equalize. Secondly, you're assuming that the U.S. consumer can afford to buy any goods. But since our GDP is down 50%, 25% of Americans who are working are unemployed, we don't have the money to buy anything. So all a tariff is going to do is increase prices, demand will not increase, and the depression will get worse. Hoover said, I've got to do something, and he signed it. And exactly as predicted, it made the economy worse. <sighs> the tariff was reversed within about six months, but the damage had already been done. Hoover's 
continue to believe that if we waited long enough, you know, the economy would come up again. But by the time we're in the fourth year of his term in office, and there is no sign the economy is anywhere close to recovering, and Franklin Roosevelt begins campaigning and saying what we need are fresh ideas in Washington, those would become, of course, the New Deal. And we need to have the federal government do deficit spending and lead us out of the recession. Congress already was on board. Even Republicans believe that that was the correct approach. When the New Deal gets proposed to the Congress, it's going to, the individual bills are going to be approved by votes of in the, in the House 400 to 20, in the Senate 85 to 6, approving stuff. Because both Republicans and Democrats in Congress are realizing Hoover's approach isn't working to get us out of the Depression. And although Hoover runs against Roosevelt, he is absolutely overwhelmed. As if Roosevelt wasn't going to win anyway. Uh, remember that a prohibition was still the law of the land. And Hoover strongly believed that prohibition was a great idea. And among the things that Roosevelt promised was you elect me and I will, this is, this is ironic, I will sign an executive order that immediately lifts prohibition until we can get rid of that silly amendment that we have. So people who weren't gonna vote for Roosevelt before, that clinched the deal. And Hoover is overwhelmed in that election and his becomes a one-term president. Hoover tried to say, I'm leading, this is what we're gonna do, we're gonna wait it out. It wasn't the right policy, it wasn't he didn't take the pulse of the American people correctly. And as a result, he was voted out of office. When we have our next session, uh, we will start with Franklin Roosevelt, uh, the president who left the greatest mark on the US presidency of any single president, in part because of the length of time he was in office but also because of some of the things he did. And the imperial presidency, which was started by McKinley, well, pardon me, uh, right, and then enlarged by Theodore Roosevelt, further enlarged by Woodrow Wilson, is going to get yet another boost from Franklin Roosevelt. I'm going to go to the q and A. Looks like I've still got a few minutes left. I'm gonna to go to the q and A, and if there are any questions in there, I will attempt to answer them during our last few minutes. So give me a minute while I go to Q&A. Here we go. Which one is, oh, I'm not even gonna read that because that was about a conversation we were having before the session started. So we're gonna, we're gonna pass on that one. Uh, didn't Theodore Roosevelt become the nature president with establishing the national park system? Um, the uh, Theodore Roosevelt did indeed uh, start the national park system and he put a lot of acreage into the national park system, but uh, presidents before him had designated, I think they were called, not, re not refugees, uh, I forget the word now, but there were areas that were designated as federal protected land. So presidents did that before him, but yes, he very much, when he became president, uh, got the uh, national park system going, which by the way, uh, is um, celebrate, well, I forget what, what year it's celebrating, but yes, he very much did. But then presidents after him also put acreage in the national park system. So yes, he did, but Congress was very much on board with that also. So that was pretty much a win-win for both groups. Uh, next question, given present awareness, would it be fair to say all white people were or are racist? I don't think Wilson was an outlier. Well, we're gonna tread lightly around that one because of the nature of this presentation and the fact that uh, YouTube allowed, pardon me, uh, Zoom allows you to throw uh, tomatoes at the speaker. I don't know if you knew that. So we want to avoid that if all, if all possible. When I say someone is a racist, what I mean is that they advocated policies of, advocated policies of segregation of reduction of rights to citizens, not whether they were racist in their mind or their attitudes, but they were political leaders who advocated racism. 
of what we would now call racism or segregation. Think George Wallace, think Woodrow Wilson. And when I use the term racist as a historian, that is what I'm referring to. I'm not referring to it in terms of how current society and politics looks at that particular word. Wilson was not an outlier. In Wilson's first term, the Ku Klux Klan had a parade down Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House. The Ku Klux Klan. Our country was racist, so was Woodrow Wilson. Edith Wilson, any impact? Uh, not in terms of uh, presidential power or evolution of the presidency. Uh, remember that Edith Wilson, Woodrow's wife, effectively was the president of our nation for the better part of the year because she limited access to Woodrow Wilson. That caused the fast moving US Congress, that was sarcastic, the fast moving US Congress to decide that perhaps we needed an amendment to work around that situation if we had a incapacitated president in the future. And we did get around to it approximately 45 years later. We now have a amendment that wouldn't allow that to happen. Congress fast on the trigger there. Um, do you have a date for the next session? As a matter of fact, I do. Give me a second, I'm referring to my calendar. And the next session for this will be in November, on November 19th, the third Thursday of that month at 1.30, we will do uh, session number five, which begins, of course, with uh, Franklin Roosevelt. And then our sixth and final session will be in December, on December 17th. The reason that we kind of doubled up like that was because we had a bit of a gap when the pandemic got started and we had to stop doing face-to-face -face presentations. So that's the reason for that. By the way, uh, we have, Annie and I have already agreed on another one-year program for next year, which will meet six times every other month again. For next year, we've already agreed on the dates of that. I can't announce the topic because I believe there are a couple of administrators at the Schomburg Library. Uh, Annie, if, if you wanna correct me on this, please do, because I know Annie's listening in. But I believe we need a couple levels of approval but we've already agreed on the dates and there will be another one year presentation package next year as well. And I certainly look forward to doing this in person. Zoom is handy, but I really, really much prefer being able to see your faces when I'm doing this. So as you go home now, uh, the rest of the afternoon, and you say to yourself, gee, what might I do for the rest of the afternoon? You could order a really good book. I have a suggestion for you, just in case you forgot the title. It's called Busville. And that concludes my presentation, Matt. I'm done. All right. Thank you, Gary. And thank you, everybody who stuck through the technical difficulties and joined our program today. Uh, you can, as always, you can find uh, these videos on YouTube. And we will see you next time. Thanks so much for coming. Okay. Bye, everybody.